can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Hello. Uh, all together. Uh, how many are we so far? Two we trainers, are... two participants. That's not a lot. Let's wait a while. <laughs> yeah. Give me a minute. I'll just get myself a drink. Mm -hmm. Maybe while uh, while everybody is listening or going away. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's the purpose of Redux? I didn't get that, to be honest. Yeah, What's, so, what, what problem does it solve uh, that is not kept or done by you state, I guess? May, or may state, I take care, care of that? If you want to. Yeah. So um, as you saw yesterday is that you can have dynamic states in, in your components, but usually your applications will consist of multiple components up to multiple <laughs> hundreds of components. and um, Redux is more or less a central store for data that is shared between um, uh, multiple components because exchanging data from components in a React is only possible um, one directional. So um, you can only pass those props you learned about yesterday mm -hmm. down from the parent component inside the component that's rendered inside of that, but not okay. really the other way around. And to mm -hmm. uh, get a solution to that, and there is this Redux store. So Redux oh. initializes some kind of central database, which uh, all components mm -hmm. then can subscribe to. Okay, I think I got it. I, I, if I remember correctly, the sample yesterday was that the FAQ item pushes information to the app and using Redux reduces that because it's stored centralized and the app or any other part or component is able to get those data, those informations, and you don't have to push it manually to an explicit component. You push it to the store and another component can pick that up. Exactly. Okay, fine, thank you. Yeah, and I think now when, when Alok's, Alok is going to continue the session from mm -hmm. yesterday, that might become even more clearer how that worked, because I think we rushed through that yesterday a bit in a yeah. hurry. So it might be good to uh, redo this in a bit. But it's but it's okay to have it heard one time and to go yeah. through that a second time. So yeah, I don't course. mind. It was fast, but it was okay. <laughs> Okay, I so, so I do not know, like only four, like we are missing four person, I think, because today I remember there are 10 and one of these is Thomas and another is Stefan. So maybe we can't eight. So we well, are they are around here. So I can just ask them <laughs> to get the line <laughs> right. Uh, one sec. Yell at them. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, until then, maybe I can just show you one thing. So since you joined earlier, so you must have some advantage, right? So you can see that like this is the Volto, right? This is the Volto repository, right, Marcus? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so, looking with you. Yeah, so you can see like this is our start client.jsx or you can uh, say it like app.jsx, right? Mm -hmm. And now we are providing the store on the top of the app component, right? Like mm -hmm. the same, right? And now you can access the state like anywhere in all those components you will find into the source folder. Mm -hmm. And you can see that how many we have, right? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you do not put your state into a centralized state, then you have to pass the data, like what we are doing, like in the app.jsx, like deleting a simple FAQ item, you have to pass this props, like, right? On it. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you have to call it from your children. And mm -hmm. just think like you have like uh, five components, right? Yeah. And this FAQ items comes last then you have to pass uh, the props. Like you first go to the uh, app, app pass to the like grand, uh, grandfather, grandfather pass it to the like, you can see the same <laughs> component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and after when it risks to the FAQ item, then you are able to call this props dot edit and then you can have to delete it, right? Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. it does not make sense. Like uh, oh. you can see, like mm -hmm. in our clone, we have control panels, right? And mm -hmm. control panels have lots of like add-ons, content types, uh, uh, mm -hmm. user, right? And you want to, uh, so, and you want to. Uh, to pass those state like you want to update the user interface whenever you add any permission right so this mm -hmm. user is an admin so what you have to do like if you do not use redux what you have to do you have to pass all the state into the app right like uh, our current structure and you have to pass it to the users component right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you also go with the ui structure of clone you will find that like you have to do uh, uh, go multiple uh, uh, user interface before you see those checkboxes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how you are going to handle that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe that's too much into detail. But what I wanted to ask is, um, when you have such a such a store, uh, application wide store, I say, mm -hmm. uh, is this mm -hmm. is it the right terminology to use application versus components or is this wrong? No, no, no. It's wrong. So, that, that's, that, that's good. Okay. okay. No. Um, when you Maybe. are on application level, this is one store for all of the components. So yeah. when I push uh, an information there, first thing would be name collisions. Second mm -hmm. one would be security sort of, uh, because every component sees those data information whatever is mm -hmm. that correct or is this yeah. separated somehow that is correct or? that is correct I... okay hmm? okay so uh, let me tell you one thing like from the point of view like first you mentioned the name collision right so you mm -hmm. might have the name collision you should not have a name uh, collision because you see we also mentioned this reducer reducer is a yeah. payment function right and mm -hmm. uh, when you when I will tell you like uh, when you want to access any state from the mm -hmm. store, you have to use this reducer function name. Like uh, you can only, okay. uh, uh, if you want to access the any state of this FAQ reducer, you have to write a state dot FAQ and then that thing. So okay. This, uh, then you think uh, like if you have multiple component, then you have multiple reducer. And every yeah. reducer have different name. You can't write the same reducer name. That's the only thing. You, you, okay. which you mind. But you already do it. Like if you have a user reducer, mm -hmm. you already name is user reducer. You do not uh, write the control panel reducer with the user reducer, right? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this is his namespace uh, sort of. Thing. Yeah, sort of. So let's get perfect. started. I think we yeah, one second. Yeah. Um, there was the, the second question. Uh, mm -hmm. about security i would just briefly answer mm -hmm. um you're absolutely correct that every component in your application will be able to access the store but mm -hmm. with react always keep in mind this is an application that um, uh, usually only runs in the front end of the user and mm -hmm. any data and it fetches you data from from an api and any data it gets from the api should be data that the user can access anyway so um true the, mm -hmm. the data is already there so um if through redux data can be accessed that the user should not be able to access then mm -hmm. you've made an error then it, on, uh, yeah then it should be level. there yeah yeah, yeah. So, okay so uh, if you think of reducer as a store you can uh, term it as a memory like uh, your local memory, which is used when you fetch the data from the store and it stores into your local browser. And if uh -huh. someone access your local browser or local storage or something, you can do mm -hmm. the SSX, right? So, okay. mm -hmm. so on browser level, it's handled. So I, uh, we do not have any security problem. So uh, okay. let's start with the Redux thing. So let me okay. uh, start with the Redux. What is, uh, is the Redux? Currently, you are seeing that for deleting a simple items from the FAQ items, you have to pass the props from the app.jsx, right? Where it is, this thing. For deleting, uh, no, for, I, we just changed it. So, so 
for uh, deleting a simple items from the FAQ items, you have to pass the props to the FAQ items and the, their delete handlers, right? And just the thing that, like this component is a uh, five level deep. So just think that there is a component uh, before FAQ item like FAQ parent, and it does something else, like it uh, do something else. And then you can also think of F FAQ grandparent, right? So if you want to pass this on delete function, first you have to pass the on delete into the your uh, grandparent, and then uh, uh, you you have to go to the grandparent component and pass this on delete to the parent, and this parent will pass it to the FAQ item, and at the last FAQ item render, right? So centralizing the state, we use Redux. This is clear. Can you someone say like thumbs up or something? Like now it's clear like why we are using Redux. I will I will shut up now because I had a special uh, introduction to that by you five yeah, minutes yeah. before. So anyone else can just uh, say yes I understand or maybe ask uh, maybe I will explain it once again. Simon, short a thumbs up. Michael too. Okay, so um, that's why we are using uh, Redux. Okay, now think of like now we have a store where we have all this uh, our state like this thing, uh, this thing. Like now we have the state of question answer and uh, and the, all the FAQ item list. Now you want to modify it, right? So how we are going to tell the store like, hey, I want to modify this list. For that triggering the request, you need to write the action. Do you understand? Like what is action for? Action is just for triggering the update change in the store. Okay. So what is the structure of the action? Action is just only a function, okay? Which takes some parameter, which you want uh, to update into the store. And you just tell them, uh, you also pass a type. So what this uh, action should do. So when you pass this type, like add FAQ item, then whatever this uh, action will, what action will do is like he, he uh, it goes to the reducer. Okay. So your question will be like, hey, look, what is the reducer? So uh, reducer is a pure function. What do we mean by pure function is it does not modify any object or array or anything or make requests if during the running of this function. Once this function is called, we cannot modify the object, the array, and we cannot uh, create a request. Right? Uh, is it clear? Like reducer is a pure function? Okay. So what we write into the reducer. So reducer takes two parameter. The first parameter, your state, like the initial state of the reducer. And the second parameter is the action. Like when this action is get dispatched or this action gets fired, this whole thing, this thing, this array thing, this object thing will be accessed here. Will be passed into this action thing, okay? and the state thing which we already declared. This makes sense. Like what is reducer and wh uh, what is this state and the action in the reducer? Okay. Okay, so now we are going to see like how we can write the reducer. So now we can see that we already have a state and we already have an action, right? This thing. Now we are going to write a FAQ reducer. So this is the reducer. And in FAQ, you are going to write the switch statement. So based on the switch statement, if it's true, run this part of the code and return, right? So this is the thing. So we access the action dot type and the action of type is add dot add underscore FAQ item. So you access the add FAQ item here. And if the case is add FAQ item, which is true. So do this thing. So what we are doing, we are returning an array and we are copying the state 
And here, the current state is an empty array, right? So we are doing nothing. And now what we are also doing, we are adding an object, an object with the question and the answer. And where this question and answer is coming from, it's coming from the action object. And what is the action object? Action object is the this thing. And what uh, can you see like the action object has the question and the answer so you can access it and you can uh, add it here. Like you can access the, the question which is passed into this thing and the uh, action dot answer which is passed from this to this. Does it make sense? And we return the state. So what does our state now should have? Our state should now have, our state should, let me open a VS code new. Okay, I can just show you on my VS code. So what will be our action should be? Like what should be our state? Our should, state should be like this thing. Like we are an array, and then we have an object and object has this question and question is like, what is your name? And it should have the answer. Does it make sense? My name is Alo. I think so. Right? So this is the thing. So you know that uh, if you see our app, so let me, uh, start my app npm start okay so i have to do that again so 1.9.0 okay so i just wait 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 npm start okay so now in our app what do we have we have three uh, Three, we are updating the state three times. One for editing, like when we are editing, right? And one is for deleting the object, right? And one for adding this uh, uh, this thing, like for adding a new and question and the answer. So what we have to do? We have to write the three uh, actions, right? One for adding the FAQ item. So this is the thing, like when you want to uh, add an item, like what is your name and hello so when we click on this add thing it should pass a uh, it should pass an action right because we are adding a new faq list item and this is our faq state right and the, what will be the second thing the second thing will be the edit like when i am making some changes then our state should update here because we are accessing all the FAQ list from this state. And the third will be the delete function. Like when you uh, click on the delete, your state should be updated so that you have the latest FAQ item. And for these three functionality, we have to write the three actions, right? So these are the three actions. So let me show you also in the code. Like this is the three item. So uh, let me explain. You. First, the add FAQ item. Add FAQ item has a type, which tell us that we have to add an item and we pass the question and the answer which we want to add. You can also see it in the here, like if I see you, uh, if I can show you, like when we are adding a new question and the answer. Oh, let's see, let's see where it is on submit. You see, like in our FAQ list, we are setting the question and the answer, right? So we just need those two things. And for editing an FA, any FAQ items, we want a type so that we can differentiate into the reducer, like it is a different action. And we have to provide the index, like which index we want to update. We have to provide our updated question. We want to, uh, we also have to provide our updated answer, right? Does it make sense for the, uh, for the action of edit FAQ item? Okay, now you uh, now we have to write an action for the delete thing. Like what happens when we click on the delete button? It should fire an action, right? And what is the type of the action? The type of the action will be like delete FAQ item. And what do we want to also to be passed? Like which uh, FAQ item we want to delete? 
and the item which we wanted to delete is the index, right? Like when you click like a, this is the FAQ item you, I want to delete. Okay, so now we will go to the reducer and see like whether we are doing it or not. Okay, so just go to the reducer thing. In the reducer function, we have three cases, one for the add FAQ item, one for the edit FAQ item, and one for the delete FAQ item, right? Let's understand each of them. So uh, once you call an action add FAQ item, what we are doing? We are copying a state and we are adding a new object, which is of type question and the answer. This is the same thing we are passing uh, from the index.js action, right? It should make sense. Now, we have another thing. Like now we are also have an action for editing a FAQ item. So let's see what we are doing. We are copying our state like this way, FAQ. And what we are doing, we are updating the FAQ at the index which we are passing from the action. So this is the index we are passing into the FAQ action.index. So we are accessing those index and what we are doing, we are filling with new updated question and answer. It also makes sense, right? Now we want to delete it. And for that, we have an action called delete FAQ item. And this is our delete FAQ item reducer. So what it is doing, it's just copying the state and we are just deleting the object or you can call it the FAQ item, which is placed at that index. And we are returning the state. Does it make sense? Like how action and reducer is attached? I think it is clear. Okay. So now another thing, like what should we do if we have multiple reducer? So we have multiple component, right? One for the user, one for the user permission, one for the workflow. Like in a clone, we have workflow where you can select the private, public, and that type of things. We also have a for the copy and the pasting. So we create a different component, right? And if you, and we want to write a, a standard logic for all those components. And for all those components, we have to create a multiple reducer, right? So how we can combine all the reducer? So React Redux provides us a method called combined reducer, which we can import it from the, uh, uh, which we can import it from the Redux. So this is the combined reducer and com in combined reducer, we just pass the object with the, all our reducers. So let us assume like we also have an, a user uh, reducer from dot slash user. So what do we have to do? Just to, we have to pass the user, right? Then our user, is, uh, user reducer will be also present into the store. Does it make sense? I think it should, okay. So now you know that this is the role of the combined reducer, okay? Now we have to go to our next chapter, like to wiring up, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the reducer and the things is complete. So now we are going to write the test for the reducer. As we can say that, like reducer is a pure function. So what does it mean by pure function? I already explained you. Like it should not modify any predefined object or any array list or it should not uh, return any, uh, uh, any uh, make any uh, async request. So it will be pure. So what it defines is like, if you pass like a same input for multiple times, it will return the same uh, object right or same uh, return input so you can think of it like a, a like an add function so if we write an add function let's see function add i'm just missing function add tabs a b return a plus b right and if i call add function with three and four then it always returns seven it never going to return any other thing and that's the uh, that's the thing which we want like if we pass the same input for a function it should not return a different result but what will happen if we modify an object so let's have a list thing let count 
equals to zero and it's keep in incrementing, right? And if you want to access it like A plus B plus count, right? So if I pass three and four, you, you are not able to tell me like, hey, Alok, it will be always seven. Does it make sense? Because count can be modified by any, uh, any uh, anywhere. So that is why it is a impure function. So we do not modify anything which is already created like the object and the array list and we also not uh, make any async request because if you make any uh, API call there, it will return different things when you call the different API, right? So we can't uh, say that, that this function is pure. So since the reducer is a pure function, we can write the test and we'll keep guaranteeing is that like if we pass this uh, thing, it will always return the same thing. I think uh, I am able to explain you what is pure function and what is reducer. Okay, so now we are going to write the reducer test. So this is the reducer test. So what we are doing into the reducer, uh, reducer test? It is just a template like which we use in the, into the JavaScript, like we uh, describe the, what is for this component. Then we are writing it handler, like is is able to handle the, the effect item. And in expect, we are calling our FAQ function, right? We are calling a FAQ function with an empty array and with an action. This is our action. Since our reducer uh, needs two things, the state and the action, right? So we are passing two things, an empty array and an empty and an action. So what is the type of action? Add FAQ item. So where does it uh, go? So it uh, matches the first thing, right? Since our, uh, our stress is an empty array for the FAQ, this is empty, right? And we are just creating a new object with the question and the answer and the action question and the action answer, and we are passing it like action. This is action, this is action question, and this is answer, action answer. And what we are uh, expecting, like when we call this FAQ function, we are expecting it to return this thing. What we are expecting to return, an array with an object with the question and the answer, and this is the question and the answer we pass. I think uh, I explained it. Are you able to get it? Okay, uh, in similar way, you can write the test for the delete function and for the edit function. Okay, so let me copy it from this thing. Okay. Why I am making some error? Maybe. Let me. Okay, so I miss something. Okay, so now I copy paste uh, the um, test for the edit and for the delete. So let me explain you also the edit and the FAQ. I think you understand that. Like in expect, we are calling a FAQ. Okay, with an uh, with uh, already we have an state, right? We are passing the state. Can you see that this is an array with the state, and in action we are passing a edit FAQ item, and we know that this is the index zero, so we are passed the index zero, and then we also like we modify the answer to be from forty two to forty three, and we are expecting to. No, to be the question should be the same and the answer should be 43. Does it make sense? I think so. Okay. And in the same way, we are also writing uh, uh, the uh, test for the delete function. Like for the delete, we passed an state, this thing. This is the state, this is the action. And we want to delete uh, this FAQ item. 
So once the delete FAQ items trigger, what will happen? We, will, we should get an empty array. And this is what we are expecting. Does it make sense? Okay. Okay, so now what we have? We have the action for the particular thing and we also have the reducer. And we also uh, retain the test for the reducer so that now our logic is right and we just need to wire it up with our current app structure, right? And for since our current, is, uh, uh, and now we have to wire it up for that, we have to create a, another component called faq.js. And faq.js is the exact replica of the app.js. So how we can wiring this thing? So we will create a faq component in component.faq.jsx and we will copy all the thing from the app.jsx and we'll put into the uh, faq dot jsx file so i have this faq dot js file in the component and in this there i have copied all the thing from the app dot jsx okay this is the same thing this thing i can show you the difference okay so now we have to wire app the app component so that we should get uh, this reducer and the store thing set up into our app project. So how we are going to do that? So first we are going to remove all the code which already present into the app.jsx because we already copy it into the faq.jsx, okay? And the first of thing which we are going to import from the React Redux is the provider component, okay? So this provider component uh, ensures that all the component which is present in your app should get the same state and the everything and your component access that and if this provider like a you have this provider thing right and you also have an a div here right and if we put this provider here and we also have a, another component like my second app Right, then all the state, which is already like which you combine into the reducer and the action, where the my second app will not able to access it. So my, pro, this provider com, com, uh, component ensures that all the component, which is below this, all the children of this provider should get the state from the, uh, from the store. Does it make sense? Anybody else? Okay. So I will remove my chances. It is just for your knowledge. So first of all, now you, uh, you, uh, we have to create an store. And how we are going to create a store? The store is created by your all reducer. Okay. So Redux provide you a create a store method which you call and you will pass all your combined reduce reducer. So this is the create a store function and we are calling the root, root reducer. So what is, if you go to the reducer.index.dsx, this is the export default. So whatever you pass all your reducer, it is gets into the store. Does it make sense? And that's the store form. Okay. And then we also have this FAQ component. We just created, imported it. And we just, uh, in the app component, what we are going to do is we we'll just write the provider and we pass the store so that all the children of this component will be able to access this store. Means it, it will be able to access all the reducer, right? And we rendered our FAQ. Okay, and if we go to our React app, it will still work because uh, we are just wiring up. We haven't uh, doing anything like uh, dispatching the action. Like we are not uh, dispatching the action from our the view component. That's why we uh, we are not updating our reducer, and we also not getting the state from our reducer. 
right? So we still have all the logic which we write uh, yesterday into our FAQ component. So if you see the FAQ component, FAQ.js, we have all these things on chain question, on submit, on edit. Now we do not uh, need of this because we are all handling into the, into our uh, handling this from our action and into our reducer. So reducer is the uh, reducer uh, will update the state for our uh, component and action will tell us uh, like when to update that state. Okay, so now we are going to use the data from the store. Okay, so the first of thing which we are going to do is like now we are going to access the state from the from the uh, Redux store. Okay, so from accessing the data from a store, we need to have, we need to import two hooks from the React Redux. One is use selector and one is use dispatch. So use selector will be used for uh, getting the state from the store and use dispatch will be used for uh, uh, used for for dispatching the action. So when we want to uh, do some action, we'll call the you will pass our action to the use dispatch. And when you want to access the state from the store, we will use the use selector. So what we are doing first, we are importing our actions from the uh, add FAQ item action action from the action component. And we also update, uh, we also imported the use selector and the use this patch from the React Redux, right? Does it make sense? I think so. So what we are now going to do is like for uh, getting the state from our uh, store, what you have to do is like you use the use selector hook and use selector hook wants a function from you. And the structure of the function will be like that. It, it, uh, it, uh, it has a callback function. We, uh, when you pass this use selector, uh, when you pass the function to the use selector, use selector call this function and, and it give you the state from the store. And how you can access a particular state from the store is from our reducer. So this state, which is passed from the store will contain all the reducers and all the state of app. But we, do, we only want the state from our FAQ reducer. So we'll access dot FAQ. Does it make sense? Like how we are getting the state from the store. Okay. So this is the thing, like we are getting the FAQ list from our store, right? And for dispatching an action, we have to call this hook. Right, this use dispatch and use dispatch returns a function and which we are storing into the dispatch function. And when we want to add the FAQ item, we'll just call dispatch our action, add FAQ item, and we call with our the question and the answer which we have. Does it make sense? Okay, and now we are going to uh, remove all the other thing from our FAQ and just going to see like how it's work, right? So this is the way we write. So if you want, you can just copy it and you can just put into your FAQ. Right now you see that we uh, we removed all the uh, on uh, on edit handler and everything. No, no, it's not into the FAQ. It's in the FAQ item. It's in the FAQ item. Yeah, because FAQ item is the, the is the component which are getting the. FAQ list from our app component. Now we do not want to depend on to the app.jsx. We are uh, directly accessing the uh, data 
in the FAQ item from the store into the FAQ item dot JSX. Does it make sense? Or I just messed up. Okay. So we'll just save this. Now this we can. Okay. So this is the first thing which we have to do. Now, that's the second thing will be like, now we have to refactor the edit and the delete action from the FAQ component. And we also have to update the FAQ item to call the action we created for our store. So now we, what do we want? So we, we get the data from the store, but we also want to modify it and also able to delete it. And for that, what we are going to do? First, we are going to remove all the on edit handler from our FAQ, layer, FAQ component. So this is the thing, let me show you first. So this is the first thing like uh, we are updating the FAQ item so that it can, so that it can dispatch the action for the edit and also for the delete. So how, the, how does it happen? Let me show you. So first thing, we import the action from edit FAQ item from the action folder. We already have that. So if I show you, like we are importing this action and this action into the FAQ item.jsx. So this is the FAQ item.jsx. Let me copy and then I can explain it. I accidentally closed my code. Read. So this is the FAQ item. Okay. So what we are just doing is like we are importing the edit FAQ item and the delete FAQ item from the action we already have. And we are just on delete. We are dispatching our action like the prop dot index, and on edit. I think I I copied the wrong. One. Let me see. Maybe on save on edit also. Okay, on edit we also have to call the edit. Okay, so. Let me tell you, like on the on save, like when after we done with the editing, we call the on save and on save, we are dispatching the edit FAQ item with the same thing, like the prop dot index, the question and the answer for our updated, which is one, this is the same thing, like which our action want. Does it make sense? Like what we are doing? We are just uh, get the action from our action folder and we are just dispatching when the that access to should be done. Okay. So uh, uh, when the on delete call, we want to dispatch the delete FAQ item action. And when we are saving the our form, we want to dispatch our edit FAQ item. Right. This is the thing which we are doing. And this is the differences. Okay. Uh, can you run tests on that for a second? Because I get an error on that behalf. Okay, so let me first copy it so that I have the same thing. Otherwise, so this is the thing. Let's go to terminal, run npm run test. One failed, and which is this? I okay, so this exact is same error. Yeah, yeah. So this is because, like, can I play? So okay. So what we have to do is like for writing the test for your uh, Redux component, you have to provide a provider. 
right? Uh -huh. yeah. In the in the context of the test, there is no application wrapper around the FAQ application component. Okay. And that's why it's unable to get the data from the store. And that's why it's uh, uh, it's uh, failing the test, right? And okay, it, now I get it, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's failing. Otherwise, we can just close it. And if we just go to our app, our React app, and if we just refresh it, like now we want to see that in action, like what do we have that, like what is your name? It should be coming from our store, right? And are we accessing the FAQ list? So let me see first thing. This is our FAQ item. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. So this patch. Where I'm using the use selector, use state. Okay, so this is our FAQ item and this is the dispatch. And this is the dispatch thing. So let me show you like once uh, we are wired up everything, I will show you, but this thing, let me, I want to show you one thing, like when we call this, this action gets called, right? So this is the state, but I'm still not using your selector here but I think we should. So I will just copy a code from above and I'll just show you like, it will be working. Okay, so I just uh, used one code like which you are using. So this is our use selector thing, which we'll copy and we'll use for accessing the state and FAQ list should we? Okay, so maybe we have to use into our app.jsx. So we'll get it, we'll remove it from here. We'll go to the FAQ.js and FAQ.jsx should be updated. Why I haven't updated the, this thing? So I missed one thing. So this is the updated FAQ. So that's why I'm getting. So now you can see that we have an empty question and an empty answer. So this is the form which is currently gets rendered because in our store, which is in the reducer, we have an empty state. Does it make sense? Like why we are getting an empty and we are not getting the those things like which we already have, like what is Plone Foundation D and what is that? So now we want to add a, add the state, like we want to add a question. So what is your name? My name is Alo. And you press save and you see, you get the same functionality, but we are not using now anywhere into, uh, we are not storing the FAQ item list into our component. Now we are storing the FAQ item list directly into our store. Does it make sense? Okay, we can also edit it. Like my name is Jacob. And when we say, we should see our updated name, like the Jacob thing. So our edit is also working. And we want to test the delete because my name is not allowed. So I'm not happy, so I just delete it. So now we have all the three uh, uh, functionality, which is earlier is working perfectly fine. Does it make sense? Everybody is, is uh, at the same point, like I, I, at the same level, I understand this, all the Redux thing and all the, how the Redux do and how the accent and the Redux and how they store. I think so. So let's move to our next topic, which is, fetching the uh, initial data or using external data.
So what do we mean by using the external data? Like uh, we do not, uh, like we want some data from our backend, right? Like our app does not have all the state, right? The, all the initial state, we filled it. We fetch the data from the, our backend and uh, put the initial data into our store. And then we uh, manipulate it. Like we update it or mutate it. And we also make a request to our backend so that it will also get updated, right? So now we are going to create a, uh, a typical node server, like a simple server, which just returns the initial data, like the so same question and the answer, which we'll see uh, earlier. So what we'll, we'll uh, do, like we first add a dependency called the Express. Express is a library which is used for creating a node server. So I'll just install it so that I can show you Express. Okay, so let me, uh, in the briefly, I can just explain you the server.js file. So we'll just require the express from our express dependency. We will initiate it, like initiate, uh, express is a function, we just initiate it and call it app. We also give it a port, like where we are, our backend will be running. And this is our initial uh, uh, state. Maybe you can think of an, an a database, like a in memory database. And when a user make a request to the slash thing, like localhost 3001 slash, we are going to return a JSON object with this FAQ. And we, at the last, we will resend our app on the port. Does it make sense? Like what is server.js is doing? We are just creating a normal node server. And in our clone case, uh, in our Volto case, it will be the clone. Right? So in the source, we are going to create a server.js and we'll put it. Okay, so now we, we can just, ls, I think cd source. And now I will do node server.js. And now you see, can you see in the terminal, like our uh, local is, is listening on to the port 3001. So maybe I can also show you one another thing. If it's gone, I do not want to be on the call. Okay, so maybe I'll show you localhost 3001 slash. Maybe I can just access and you see, and getting the data like question and the answer. This is the same thing where you get it from your backend, right? To make a request to your uh, API and the API returns you. Right? So now we are going to make an action for that particular request. So when our app loads, fire this uh, action so that we can make a, an API request and thus API returns are the data which is provided by our database. So we'll just create the same action. This is the same action function. It has a type like get FAQ items. And we also, now we have a, in action, we are also providing a, another thing called request, a request object, a request keyword, which contains an operation. Like what are the, it is the operation is the get and the path will be the slash, right? And I will just, put this action in our action.index file. Okay, does it make sense? Okay. So now uh, we are in the case like where you have to uh, have to change a slight modification into your mental model. So from this point of view, like what you are seeing the current the flow of the React and the Redux thing is that the React Redux things is a synchronous. Like you call, you dispatch a function from the action, action dispatch it, and the reducer get the action, action modifies your state, those state goes to your view. Does it make sense? This is the whole cycle. You just have to remember. And if this process is synchronous. Okay. For making a asynchronous request, in the middle of the action and the reducer, 
right? You, we have the axon, we have the reducer, but in middle, we want to do something. What do you want? From the axon, if the axon has an request keyword, we want to make a request, right? And we will dispatch an action to the reducer telling him like, hey, it's pending. Like we make a pending request. And when we get the data from the async request, we make a, another dispatch saying it's success. Like, hey, this is the success. And if it's failed, we'll dispatch another uh, request and we'll call it like it's failed and your state will be updated, right? Does it make sense? I think so. So let me just show you and then we'll, I will tell you. For doing this thing, for this action thing, and this is the reducer, and we have to put something into the middle. So that's why it's called middleware. And for the making the request, we have to write an, a middleware. Mainly you do not have to write any middleware, but since we are we are uh, written this into our clone volto, we should know. Uh, mainly you will use Redux Tank, Redux Saga, something like that, and it will uh, handle it on your behalf. Okay, so this is the store. You do not have to, uh, maybe I can just explain you uh, a bit. Like uh, uh, the store has a function, like you can see a store, a store is returning another function, right? And this function returns an another function. And at the end, this is the thing which is getting called. Does it make sense? Right, so now we have a closure thing, right? So this function can read the next value, like whatever will be the value of next, it can be read by this function because this function is called in this next function. So this function becomes the closure of this next function. And since this function is in the scope of the next, so it can also uh, get the data from the next object or whatever with the next parameter. Does it make sense? If you know the closure in the React or into the simple functional scope, like whatever is the, the variable you defined here will be accessed by another function. It is called the closure since it can read this parent, it can. And this next will also able to read the store since it is the closure of this function. So this is the only way we can see. And you see, like if in action, if we have request, if we do not have a request, just call the next function with the action, like whatever action we passed and it was called. If, if we have the request, then what we are doing? We are just uh, doing a pending request, right? So what will be, the, this is our action. This is our action. So what will be appended at the end? Like get effect to items is pending, right? This will be the type, right? And what we'll do, we'll make a promise request like fetch, HTTP local uh, request path, method request.operation, body will be request data or json.stringify request data. This is the simple thing which you do for the fetching the data. And once the uh, promise is resolved, we are just uh, uh, getting the response.json and after the uh, response.json, we are dispatching a new request, new action, a new action with data type will be type success. So this will be get effect to item success. Does it make sense? And in, in and the end, we are also returning the action promise. Okay. So now in our app.jsx, we have to get the apply middleware function from the Redux. So I'll just grab the apply middleware. I'll go to our app.js. We'll get it from our Redux, right? And we'll just put it into when we are creating the store. And we also have to import that middleware. Right, and for that, I have to create this middleware in middleware api.js. So 
in the source i have to create a middleware middleware file folder and the middleware folder we have api.js api.js in the api.js we have this Okay, does it make sense? Like, this is the same thing, right? Okay, now we have three more case for the get FAQ items, right? For get FAQ item action, we have three new case, the success, the pending and the fail. We haven't covered the fail, but it should be there. So now we have to go and we also have to update our, F, uh, our FAQ uh, reducer for so that we have the case for what should we do if we have a pending request for this thing get FAQ items and what should be our uh, be our success right so if our uh, you know, we just want to listen for the access thing and if there is pending will be our it will be handled be our default case since it does not match any case it will be uh, going to be default right this is the switch statement Right, so if the action of that type will be checked for this thing, since this is not a get FAQ item pending, this is also not, this is also not, this is also not. So it will be just return the state. I think it's, it will make sense. Like if you know the switch statement, this is how it works. Right, so in reducer, we'll just add a, another case. Like if our case is, this thing just return the action dot data and if you see the middleware we are doing the same thing like we have an type success and we have the action dot the data this is the data which we are passing from the middleware does it make sense because this is the important thing Okay, so now we are going to look into a, another hook called huge effect hook, right? But why we need a huge effect hook, we are first going to see. So now we have a reducer, we have the action, right? But when we want to call this API request, right? We, do, we can't call the API request when the component is rendering because React received this function component as a pure function, pure function, right? So every component which you ever written into the React, this function thing should be pure. You can only make the API request or anything into your event handler because those will be handled after the rendering. Did you understand this part? Okay, so what is the huge effect hook? So what we want, if our component is getting rendered and just after that, we want to make an API request and we do not have any handler for that. In JavaScript, we have a handler for the on click, on mouse, on hover, everything, right? But uh, in React, we want to tell you that, hey, once this component is rendered, please make this request. For that, React provide you the, and a hook called huge effect hook. So what will React will does? Like once the component is rendered, then React will go and call this huge effect hook, which you have written into your component. And you can write multiple huge effect hook just after one another, just keep in one rule. Like you can't use into the if else condition. I think it, much, uh, it makes sense, like whatever I have said. Okay, so let's go. So first we'll get the action from our get FAQ items. So if you see our index for getting the, the uh, uh, FAQ items, we are 
using a get FAQ item action. So in FAQ.js, right? In FAQ component, we'll just get a, another like, hey, give me this get FAQ item action. And what do we want? We want to call it once the component is rendered and we call is this huge effect. We also have to import it from React. Okay. And one thing you have noticed this thing, this thing. Okay. So if you do, uh, this is called the dependency array for the huge effect rule. If you do not provide anything, whenever this component render, this is huge effect will be called, right? So if you do not provide this dependency array, well, every time your component renders, it will make a request to the your API, which is not the case which we want. What we want is that whenever this dispatch chains, right? We only want to make an API, uh, API request uh, only when we want to make the API request when our component is rendered first, right? So we are just passing a dependency array like, hey, if the dispatch change, then only call this huge effect, like whatever this function is. You see in huge effect, we are passing a function and in function, you can do whatever the hell you want to do. All the async stuff, all the thing which you want to modify, you can do anything which is provided by the JavaScript. Does it make sense? Okay, so this is a simple hook. This is the huge effect hook, which uh, we just want a function which you want to call once the, your component is rendered. And this is the dependency array. If you do not do pass any this dependency array, then React will render call this function every time whenever your component is rendered. If you uh, put it null, like if you remove the dispatch and you just put this, this thing, this thing, then this huge effect is only runs once. Right, so it's telling us to react that, hey, once this component is rendered and once this huge effect is uh, hook is uh, uh, run, like this function run, never run this uh, function uh, once again. And when you are telling it, like when you are writing this uh, dispatch, so whenever this dispatch changes, this huge effect will, uh, this function will get executed. And one thing for case, like one thing so you have to remember, like whatever the, uh, the thing, like the use state, the use dispatch, whatever this function uh, gives you, uh, uh, gives you or whatever the comp function it will give you from the React, like the set question, the set answer, this thing will never be getting changed. Like it will be like your method, like it, it will always be same. So let me show you like what I am trying to do, say. So what will uh, React will do is like, once the, your component is getting rendered, then it goes to the huge effect loop. And then it's going to check your dependency array. And then it will just do a shallow comparison, like whether the dispatch is changed or not. Since you're there, if it's just a number, like three is not going to change, right? So this function is never rendered. But if you have an, an array, Right, then I can just show you like this array not equal to this. Right, so this is why uh, the React guarantee you that whatever this huge effect is returning, this set question, the set answer, if it's a function, since it is a function, it will not change into the render and function is also an object. So if you call this thing, if you compare two function, it always be false. If if other is not an instance of the same function, it will always be false. Uh, for better, uh, Jacob just posted you a link regarding the uh, huge effect. You can read it. Right. So in huge effect, we are dispatching a get FAQ items, and this is the FAQ item selection. It, uh, it uh, calls your request, the middleware take care and everything is do it for you, right? 
So now go to let me see like where if we have used this get this function or not. So right. So we now have the empty effect list. So we are using. Okay. So we are at the same position, I think. Right. And just one thing, let me update the, our my app component so that I can show you. This is the effect you I always just effect system. So you can see that um, we are fetching the get FAQ items. Right. And this get FAQ items is called calls into the dispatch use effect and use effect caused it. So let's see how our app now behaves. Now you can see, now we have this return question and the answer, right? It's not uh, previously there. Can you remember it? And why is why this happening? Let me explain once, once a time more, like one more time. So what will it be happens? Like once uh, our FAQ component is getting rendered. So this component is getting rendered, right? So what, we, uh, what it does, like it's make a, try to get the FAQ items from the state, like from the store. Since uh, it's null, it's just the uh, empty, right? Then we have dispatch, then we have question and the answer. After this component render, we make a request. This use effect function get executed. And what will does, it calls this action, this get FAQ item. And this is what, it is a request with the operation get and this. This will be handled by our middleware, right? And after middleware, it will go fetch the everything. And after that, the promise resolve and promise resolve return a success, uh, success action type. So once our reducer receives this, get FAQ item success, it updated our state with the action.data. And the action, uh, action, uh, action of data is the same thing, this thing, this array. So once this uh, state is updated, our reducer, uh, our uh, the Redux call our function to re-render itself. Or you can call it component, like it, uh, like whenever you use selector, so whenever uh, the anything which changes into the state of a particular reducer, this function will be re-rendered re once again. So this function is getting re-rendered and after re-rendering, we are getting the data from the backend and the backend provides you an array with the object and the question and the answer. So this is the FAQ list and we are rendering the FAQ list here. Does it make sense? Everybody is clear on the same place like where we are. Okay, so now we are moving like now we have only, only now we have to uh, see the routing and then we are, we'll be exactly. done. Exactly. Alok, maybe can you um, make the routing uh, quite quick because we're yeah, yeah, yeah. again because running we low on time and we have a whole other training to do after yeah, yeah, this. Yeah. So, okay, so um, I'm not going to show you the Maybe routing. not. Maybe I go hoping... about uh, on it briefly and explain uh, how it yeah, yeah. Work, works in principle, but not the detailed implementation. Yeah, so now we are going to implement the routing. So we have different pages into our view, like our you have slash user for the profile and everything slash checkout for the checkouting for the slash for the bag items for the bag items. So how you can uh, use it. So we'll use a dependency called React Router DOM which uh, will take care of all our routing uh, for our case. Since it is single page application, we will not use an anchor tag, which you used previously because it's reload our application and it will damage our state and we'll be on the initial state. So what we'll be doing is like, once again, we have to get a provider from the React Router DOM, like the browser router. It will take care of the, all the routing and the context of that routing, like where you are going, where you are returning, all the patterns, all the things which you get from the router. And this is the route, route function, what is that like? Like if the path is met, the component is gets rendered. If the, this path like FAQ index match, the components get rendered. This is the, our app.jsx, does it make sense? And we also created a FAQ item view, with, which will just render the question and answer in the field view. Like since you can see like a blog post, 
like blog post has the heading and the uh, description and FAQ item as a uh, description, uh, like a title in the description. And when you click onto that, it get full pleasure, like we'll get all the thing. So we are uh, creating the same thing. Like if you click onto a app and you click into it, then it goes to a, another page, which only shows that question, the, that particular answer. So we all have a, uh, okay, so this is the thing. So writing the view, so we are not using anything. We are just using the FAQ items question and we are just using the FAQ item answer and you have to get the FAQ item. This is our to do. So I'll just explain you like how we are going to use it. So whenever we go to this thing, like route path FAQ index, this FAQ item view gets rendered, right? So this thing is getting rendered. So how we can uh, access our the access the particular uh, uh, FAQ items. So how we can do is like uh, the React Router provides you and use params hooks. So use params hooks already have an index field because uh, into the router you have written this index. So it will just provides uh, the index uh, from that. And from the index, we are using a use selector. Use selector, uh, we went to the store will uh, grab the like if the length of the FAQ list is true, uh, greater than the uh, is, if it exists, then we'll just grab that that particular question and the answer. And that's the thing like that's this is the way we will use the routing. Are you able to just mimic something? Yeah. And then we are going to using links to navigate. So this is the route thing. Like whenever you go to the particular route, those component can render. But now we want to just, uh, when you, if you want to click into some page, it should go to that route, right? So how we can do it? For that, we are we will use the link component. And for the, once again, for React Router DOM, we are going to import the link. And you just write the link like that. Like you'll just put link to and the FAQ props.index like FAQ slash zero or one, or like whatever question. So in the FAQ items, we will just import a link component from React Router DOM. And we just create a button like or a link with the view. So once you click into the view, it just go to there. And this is how you use the link component. And the last one we will be like navigating from the user address. So let's see, like you have a link, right? You click into link, you go to your login page, right? The login uh, route, a login route uh, gives you the component of the login. You fill the login, uh, username and the password, you click on the submit and the submit success. And then you want to return it back to the front page. So how you can do it? So we'll just create a, just we'll mimic that feature. You can use it using the huge effect or in that case, we are creating a button into that view. So when you click into the that button, the back button, it will go back. So how we can do that? For that React Router DOM, you provide you a, a hook called use history. And use history has all the history of your navigation. And it also has a push method. So if you use like history.push slash thing, it will just push this back to your desired uh, route wherever you want to it. So this will be the thing like let history equals to use history. We have a button on back. So when on back gets called, we call this function and then we call history.push slash and it will go back to that. So yeah, that will be from the React router, like the React training and that's it from my side. So and now the Jacob will tell, uh, take it over from me and he'll going to show you from the Volto, like how we can do the basic Volto site and make anything from that. So now we have a knowledge or slightly knowledge from the React. Now we're going to learn about the world. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time and everything. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Alok, for, for giving this awesome training on React and giving the people the knowledge they th then in turn can also use in my training now for uh, actually working with Volto. Um, Alok, I guess I'll take over the screen sharing from now on. And also, I think um, now is a good time to uh, give it a big, uh, not a big, a bit of a break. 
um i'll say five minutes just uh, if anyone needs to go to the bathroom or uh, grab a coffee or something um and or just rest their eyes um, um we'll do that now i'll say five minutes so uh at 16 25 european time we'll continue uh and i hope to see you back and um alok and i will be around during the break i think um to answer any questions if uh, those came up or accept them some general feedback Yeah, short feedback. Uh, awesome, thank you. Again, for uh, uh, recapturing the Redux part, uh, because that's went over my head yesterday. So this is way better today. Thank you again. Thank you for the feedback. uh 1625 on the spot so i think we're good to continue with uh with the second part of the training and i hope you'll like it as as much as as the first part um so um first thing is oh, eh, Share my screen. Uh, does that work? Hello, can I get quick feedback of if my screen sharing is all right? Oh, okay. I don't know. It did Alok talk or not? Because I can't hear anything. Uh, he didn't talk. Can you ah, hear okay. me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, then. Um, what we'll be starting with today is uh, the Volta training. Um, yep, yeah, for, for Volta 2021. And we'll start with uh, a first look on how Volta looks. Uh, for those of you who've already seen it, uh, you're probably quite familiar with it. Um, for those who haven't seen it yet, um, just a quick introduction. Um, Volta is the name of the new front end application introduced with Clone 6, uh, which will be the main front end to uh, create any site and work with any site that runs Clone 6. Um, we have a demo for that here at volta.concept.com uh, which any of you uh, can visit if you like. Um, let me quickly pop up the chat again. Uh, one sec. Okay, where's my Zoom? Go. Uh, bit of trouble with the screen sharing here. Ah, up there's the chat. Okay, that's awesome. Um, exactly. And the main basis of Volto, in um, difference to the classic uh, clone editor that you might be used to is that we introduced the system, a system which is called blocks. It is broadly inspired by the block system introduced with the Gutenberg editor in WordPress. But um, we, of course, gave it um, the touch it needs to properly work with clone and with our vision from Volta. Um, 
which means uh, the editing experience has been massively streamlined in comparison to older projects because to edit a page, as I just demonstrated here, it's just the push of a button over here and you're more or less on the same page as a normal user sees it, but you can edit it, edit it with the usage of different kinds of blocks that um, are already implemented or, and that's the interesting part we'll learn today, with blocks you can code yourself and add to your pro projects on your own rather easily. Um, uh, for the architecture on how this whole thing works is that we still have the a normal clone backend running um, in the background of our server, the classic clone with a ZODB and all the data structures, clone developers, the clone developers uh, that are here are already used to. And then we have the promise API, which exists, already exists for quite a few years that we now fully leverage to um, create the Volto front end as a completely separate application in the browser of the user that then communicates with the server to render the pages, to transmit changes and so on and so on. Basically giving the full power that uh, an editor or admin in the old clone backend had into uh, this new nice uh, Volto front end. Um, you can see that we're communicating or that Volto is communicating with, with the backend when you open up the, your network tab in your browser, you'll be seeing a bunch of requests that Volto is doing to the normal clone backend and for, for example, here retrieving all of the content types that are available on the page and all other information that is needed to render this page. Um, so to have you on board um, with what Volto is in general, I think we can now jump right into our training. We'll be doing the Volto hands-on training today. I know there might have been a bit of a miscommunication um, in before with a announcement of a separate Volto hands-on training and then uh, that uh, again being canceled and so on and so on. Just to um, get you all on the same page, we are doing the Volto hands-on training. I'm pasting the link into the chat right now. This year, not the Volto training here, the, those are two different trainings, the Volto training here um, and the Volto hands-on, they are quite similar, but um, the Volto training takes quite, uh, quite a bit of more time longer than, than the hands-on. And in many places is a little bit more theoretical than the hands-on, but as with the hands-on will be just um, diving straight into the code and doing our own blocks, our own theming, our own uh, content type views, and so on and so on and so on. So I think this is a bit more fitting training for what we want to achieve today. Um, first of all, um, we'll go through what um, tools and technologies we will use and that would be good if you already are familiar with. Um, with React, I know that you're now familiar with that for, uh, as Alok did quite a good job of doing that. Um, then we have Jan. Jan, Jan is a package manager based uh, on the node package manager that we'll be using to uh, fetch our dependencies here. Um, if you don't have that installed, please 
go over here and um, follow the installation instructions from uh, from Jan. Um, I think that shouldn't be too hard and I hope most of you are already uh, on board with that. Then yeah, JSX, the syntax Alok taught you the other day and to also today. Then we have Volto as a tool, obviously. Um, already explained that. Then there's the Volto generator, which I'll introduce to you in a minute. And I think as pretty much everyone who's um, in the training here probably already knows, we'll be using Clone um, for the backend and SR CMS, obviously. Um, um, so let's jump right in into our uh, into our uh, into into the training by getting ourselves the Volta generator, um, which is a neat little tool just to get you on board and get everything set up to start working with Volto. You can, after you've installed it with the commands over here, you can just open up your terminal like I do here. And um, first of all, create a folder um, for our training. Let's call it Volto hands-on for this cd into it, run the command. And what should happen is that you get those uh, a few questions asked by the generator. For uh, first, the project name, we can just go with whatever folder name we used for our use case, or also type in anything else, whatever you want. I'll just say with the Volto hands-on. And it will ask you whether you want any add-on products for Volto. And for our use case today, we're super happy with just using the plain Volto and nothing else on the side. So we'll just press enter to default defaults. And after that, you'll be seeing this screen, hopefully. installing all the dependencies and setting up your Volto environment. This might take a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on your internet connection. Uh, mine here seems to be quite decent. So we're making good progress. There we go. Um, let me know when we are, when you're all ready with that, when you're coding along. Yeah, that, that's something I forgot to say in the beginning. You feel free to code along, but if you, uh, don't want to do that right now, you can, of course, just watch the training and then do the coding on your own afterwards using the training resources on training.clone.org. Um, Advantage of coding along now, obviously, is that when you run into trouble, Alok and I are already present to answer any questions that might come up. Okay. So as we can see from our console output already, is we can now already just start off to front end by running the yarn start command into side of our project folder in the console. That will again usually take a few seconds. The time that takes depends on your computer. And there we go. Now that we have Volto running, we can actually access our Volto instance on your local host 3000. As 
And as you can see on my screen now, we get a connection refused. That is because we don't have any clone running on our computer. There's no data bias, no backend, no, no nothing that uh, our Volto instance could be able to connect to. So we just get more or less a 404 error screen here. To tackle that, we also need to set up our clone instance. For that, we'll be using the Plone 6 Docker container. So uh, apart from Docker, um, you don't need any other dependencies on your machine, don't need to install anything else, just run the Docker command in another tab of your console, and that will bring you up a working clone instance. Um, we'll do that. Up. You know what, we'll do that in a separate tab because we won't touch it anyways anymore after we've started it. This will also take a few seconds to a few minutes depending on your machine and your internet connection. If you don't have Docker installed, that's uh, also something that you can do real quick from the Docker website. Um, I'll paste, also paste that. Um, be aware that when you're using a Mac, that's a problem I ran to a while ago when I tried Docker. Before you can run the uh, command in your console, you need to really start up the application uh, with the whole UI thing and agree to some uh, user and agreement thing. Otherwise, you'll just get error messages from your console. But that's just uh, on the side. Most important thing here is now that we can see that our Plon server is up and running. And that's actually the thing we'll be looking at first before we actually jump right into the uh, Volto instance. Uh, buh, buh, buh. No Xcode or CLT version detected. Takes oh. uh, Michael's Plone 6 is running. That is awesome. To be honest, on the spot, Marcus, I don't really know how to uh help you with that i guess you need to uh, install xcode first which might take a while and he's uh, running with a docker uh, jacko hmm? wait a Sorry? second All uh, with the jacko uh with yes. the uh with the docker yes you mean clone uh, volto inside of docker yeah maybe he can try the docker run thing for the clone no, no, no. All fine. All fine. Was All just fine? an error message. Uh, the server is compiling, so it might, it might be online in a few seconds. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Um, so let's check out our uh, clone service on 8080 first. Here we go. And as we can see here um, that there is no clone site created just now, so uh, we'll do that. But because we're using Balto, we need to do a few smaller amendments, and that's why we're clicking on the advanced button. And down here, we want to disable the example content. Uh, that's not necessary for the training. It also won't hurt if you leave that ticked, but uh, um, you can untick that. But what we definitely need is vault the clone dot volto add-on um obviously and then uh also the default content for the home page so that we have a bit of a useful content we can work with in the beginning and after we tick those two boxes and untick that one up here 
we can just hit on a neat green create clone site button and give clone a bit of time to create all the content and um, database entries we need for our application. And there we go. So the clone devs uh, with us, this should look quite familiar because it's just a simple uh, clone interface uh, as it looked like since clone four or five, I'm not sure. But when we reload our uh, tab on localhost 3000 now, we can actually see Yuhu where uh, actually connecting to our clone backend. Um, while we are working with those uh, with our pages, um, your clone Docker container leave that running in, in another tab of your terminal and don't touch it again. That can just stay there and answer our requests. We won't. Uh, do anything with that anymore. So we will focus on the uh, Volta process running on the, in the other con console. After we've set up that up, um, we can basically just jump right into our code for that I'll quickly stop our instance again to uh, open up the code editor in the Volto hands-on. Uh, I'm using VS Code here. Um, you again can use whatever editor uh, fits you the most on what you're used to. But for JavaScript development, VS Code is a pretty solid choice. Um, I've also added a few extensions here uh, for our editing experience, Prettier, ESLint, and what is also Prettier style lint. Not sure whether that's even around here. Are uh, recommended here, style lint. If uh, you want to install it, you can do that now. If not, it's not a big problem if you don't do that. It's just a small hint for you. Before we start coding, we need to make us aware what we want to achieve of our, with uh, our website, how it looks, shall look like after the training. And for that, um, this training documentation uses the um, old clone.com website that actually is no longer available. And so for the clone devs here, this is a bit of nostalgia, maybe. Um, I've added the link to the um, Internet Archive version of that page the last time it was online in here, so we can actually see it, uh, how it was living the last time you could visit it in here. But we also have this screenshot just for reference um, on what we'll be doing. I'll open that uh, in a new tab so we can pop that up from time to time to see how much of pro uh, how much progress we've been making on um, creating this page. All right. Also, um, as you can see, there are a bunch of images and other things that will uh, need to use on our page for that to make those accessible to you. I've uh, uploaded them to this Google Drive over here. I'll paste the link in here and I'll uh, ask you to uh, just download those bunch of images onto your machine and put them into some folder for reuse later on in the training. We'll 
when we are um, improving the training, I think I'll look for a better solution than providing those in a Google Drive, because I think that's not the optimal solution at the moment. After we're done with that, we'll jump right into the theming part of our training, which means um, we'll answer the question on how do we actually uh, modify anything uh, that the user can actually see on our page in terms of uh, CSS and styling. So no um, changes to the HTML rendering, but only the styling. That's what we'll be doing first. Um, Walter uses um, semantic UI as a UI framework on its basis and uses uh, the theming engine of semantic UI uh, to then actually um, create themes for your site, which means we have the default theme from semantic UI as a basis. On that is the um, Volto UI package applied to make our page look like this and not like the semantic UI theme. And what we'll be touching today is then the site specific theme parts to make your page look like whatever your page has to look like. To um, start theming here, we'll um, start quite simple by just changing the normal font that is used on the page. For that, we'll uh, create a new file in our project. So we'll up our code editor here and go into the theme folder. This is where all our CSS or less in our case, because we're using uh, the less CSS preprocessor language to uh, make life a little bit more easier and um, at, at, for example, variables that we then can reuse in your codes with, with, with uh, normal CSS this is actually possible now, but um, there are a few other language features with the last preprocessor language that we can leverage to help us write better styling code. So inside of our site variables folder, we'll just declare a new variable. That is the font name variable that will be used on the whole page to use another font than normally. So if we go to our page here and inspect the code we have, we should have uh, Open Sans defined as, your, as our current font family. And actually we don't have that. Let me have a quick glance on what might lead to that. It's the, ah, okay, yeah, obviously, because that's not our local instance, because our local instance is here. And then we have the same problem, great. And the saved, so right folder, sometimes restarting the instance might help. Here we go. Check it out. And we have open sense. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Next thing in line with the theming would be to actually write some uh, 
proper CSS and not just dangling around some variables that are already set uh, and applied all over the page, but um, writing uh, CSS on your own for that. We'll also go into our theme folder and create another folder next to the globals for the called extras. Uh, the naming here are just conventions that you should use. and create our custom overrides in here. All right, if you've done with that, we can proceed to the next part of the training. And that is to add the styling for our uh, header component on the side. Um, here we have the image of the old clone.com page and we see the header has the clone logo on the right. It has a black background. It has a white font. The font I think is set to bold. A few things that we need to do there. Um, I'll just grab our code from here, which is just basic CSS code that you should be used to if you have any experience with web development. Put that in here. My style linter complains that uh, the order here is wrong, but that will get fixed when I save it. That's not a big, is not really a big issue. Um, and right after we've saved it, when we open it up on our port 3000 and reload the page, nope, that's not happening. Then I think to for Volta to pick up the new file, we got to restart our instance. Reload the page and here we go. We have at least the black background color for now. Um, to now, uh, uh, continue our styling, we um, get some code for the actual items. So the uh, navigation items up here, though those are still black and don't really look well on that. And also this pink bar is not really what we want on that page. For that, we can grab the code and get that into our editor. And here we see one of uh, an example of the uh, language features of the less uh, preprocessor language that we can actually nest uh, CSS rules inside of each other. So instead of having to write um, this whole mess and then again with the a dot item selector, after it, we can just go put the this selector inside of that selector and it will work for just fine. After saving, we can see that our home button is actually now white. The um, home navigation link. Uh, and then we'll just a bit uh, add a bit uh, of further CSS to make the bottom margin of the page. So yeah. down here, fitting to the old version. Just drop that in right here. There we go. Um, what we are able to see now is that uh, the logo is still different and we can't style the logo because that's in static asset and that's part of the HTML. So we can't really modify that uh, via CSS. So we'll take a look on how to 
um, replace that. Um, for that, we'll um, dive into the component shadowing mechanic of Volto. When you open up your code editor in your project and uh, you'll see that there is an um, omelet folder inside of there, which is uh, actually a symlink into the um, Volto dependency installed inside of your node modules in here um, that you can use to uh, scroll through the original Volto co code that your application is using at the time. Um, and from in here, you can use the component shadowing mechanic to override any component that is inside of this source folder here. So you can grab any file, any um, path you want and override that using the uh, component shattering mechanic. So in our case, we want to override the logo. So we'll just go and locate that quickly um, because that is in the path source, components, theme, logo. And in here, there's a logo SVG file. This is the file we want to replace. Now you might ask yourself, how do I do that? Do I just drop a new one into the omelet? Um, that is not the case. For that, we have in the source directory of our own application, a customizations folder. Um, this is where we do all of the customizations that are needed to existing Volto components. Um, so, sorry, yes. one question. I have no omelet folder. I know the omelet folder, but I don't see it in my current project. Okay. Um, I don't. It's not really... a big of a deal, but I just wanted to mention I did all the steps okay. like it's on the documentation and all you, as you did, said, but I can't see it right now. Okay. That's indeed a little bit weird. Yeah, as a, as a stopgap solution, you can just uh, open up the node modules at clone Volto folder, maybe in another code editor or somewhere else to get the same result or create a symlink by yourself. Okay. Um, so now that we know the path uh, to the logo, um, we need to replicate that inside of our customizations folder from the base of um, the source folder in the omelet. So in that case, that was um, uh, the folder components in inside of that theme. And inside of that, there was the logo folder if I'm not mistaken. Let's double check that, components, theme, yes. and down there, logo, exactly. And inside of your newly created logo folder, you then can drop in your new logo. I'll just uh, quickly go over to the, uh, to the Google Drive and get the, logo SVG, download it down here, save it, and then uh, now my Zoom sidebar is in the way, let's put that up here, so maybe rather down here, fits me better. Um, Take that and then um, get that over here the best. Drop it in here. Here we go. So uh, when we now check our Volto, we'll see that the logo still hasn't been replaced. That is because 
when we add any new file to our customizations folder, we actually need to restart the Volto development process in our console. Otherwise, it will not pick up the new file. Um, when you add new files in the components folder or in any other place inside of your uh, source directory here, um, that should not be necessary, but uh, when you drop in new files and new folders into the um, customizations directory, you always need to restart your production process. So we see that that's now done and we reload the page. And as you can see, we now have the clone logo up here. Exactly. So now um, that we're done with that, for further customization uh, of the header, we um, want to remove um, the search that we have here, because that's not uh, actually there. And also, um, let me quickly log out as a user and close this on here. We have this login button up here that we also don't want to have in our page. We could just go and hide that via CSS, but um, to get rid of those links and this input field properly, we need to uh, amend the actual HTML code of the header component. For that, again, we'll be leveraging the uh, customizations engine and overwriting the header component. So again, we can check in our omelet folder where uh, the header is located. Usually um, everything that a user can see on the page, all components are inside of the theme folder here inside components and uh, everything that has to do with the editing experience is inside the manage folder as a rule of thumb. I think for your projects, there might oftentimes be exceptions from that or things that don't uh, really uh, fit in any of those categories, then you can also create more folders in your project, but this is how uh, it's roughly split up in Volto. Um, and here, there's also a header folder with a header JSX file. And um, to spare us the work to completely rewrite the header, uh, which is not necessary because we only need, want to remove a few things, we'll uh, take, take it, copy it, and then do the same as we already did with the logo and uh, replicate the path inside the customizations. We already have the components in the theme folder, so we only need to create the header folder here, paste um, the copied um, header.jsx in there. Uh, okay, I just closed the wrong one, reopen it again. And as you might have learned, um, what we need to do now is restart the uh, development process because we've added a new file to the customizations. After you've done that, you again won't see any change because um, you're overriding the header component uh, with basics, basically the same markup. Um, to get the results we want, we now go into the um, render JSX down here. So you see the header is actually a React component. That's something um, I think Alloc did uh, not dive into with you in detail. This is not a normal React function component, but a React class component. They generally work the same way. They also return JSX down here, but uh, are a bit of a 
uh, left over from, from the beginnings of React where they were needed so you could uh, use state at all in a component because those state hooks use state uh, were only introduced a few years back and then before that was only possible with class components. Nowadays, in most cases, you only use the um, function components. Um, and I think many of the Volto components will also be converted into function components over the next uh, few months to um, accommodate that. Um, so when we get down here into the markup that is rendered, we can just remove the two things that we uh, that we don't want, which is here, the search widget and the language selection uh, selector, or uh, just delete the whole uh, tools search wrapper part of the navigation and uh, not of the navigation of the header, save the thing. And when we check it out in our browser, you'll see that those things are gone. Um, Uh, are we all on the same page here now, or uh, does anyone have trouble doing this? As you can question, uh, no, as you can tell, I have big question, uh, big problems because I don't have the omelet folder and I have a hard time finding the files to just do it with mm. you. So, um, yeah, 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 I can understand. If, uh, I see. So, um, I mean, you can just replicate the paths that I did here because they will be uh, the same for everyone here. Basic, basically, yes, the logo I could change, but the head of JSX file, I can't ah, yeah, type I it that see. fast, you know. I, I, uh, I get it, I get it. Um, yeah. And uh, by copy pasting it from GitHub, um, it's not working right now, but. Okay, well, let me think whether uh, I can find a solution for you. Um, do you know how to manually set up a symlink to a folder on your machine? Yes, I do, but I don't know where to find the omelette folder. Um, I, I the the omelette via... folder is not a folder. The omelette folder is just a symlink yes, to the... Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but so, the, the target of the symlink is um, inside is... the Docker, I guess. No, no, the... no. Are, are you ah. running with Docker? The, the no, Docker no, should only the... be... The Docker okay. should only be used for the back end. Your front end files are actually there running on your machine, not inside okay. of some arbitrary Docker. Ah, so it's in node modules. Okay. Exactly. It's in node modules at plone slash volto. You can just set up. A, okay. Yeah, set One up second. I didn't get there. that. Okay. Just to make that clear again, if anyone else had the, the same misunderstanding, the Volto part, what we're doing now, everything runs actually on your machine, on your system, and not in, uh, in a Docker VM that's set up. That's only uh, our backend because we don't really need to work with that at the moment with the application code of that backend. Can you show me the, the deeper steps of the of the path of the node modules? Node again? modules, add clone, and then inside of the Volto. Then is Volto, and where do I find the header JSX, for example? That's inside um, theme or source. Uh, source components, components theme. theme. Okay, yeah, exactly any components that we are uh, overriding 
via the customizations engine are inside the source folder inside of Volto. So um, stuff from the theme folder cannot be overwritten using the customizations engine. So I'm, with the theme folder, I mean this top layer theme folder that contains all the um, less and semantic UI files, not the theme folder inside the components. That might be a bit confusing to you. Okay, now I found the files, but copy pasting is somehow broken. I, I don't get it right now. I just okay. will look with you and let it All stay right. there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you anyways. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, I think um, with that out of the way, we can continue with, with the training. Um, now um, that we have we've had a look at the component shadowing, we can also take a look on um, what we can do with our footer. Um, in our screenshot, we can see that the footer here also has the um, logo implemented yeah. in it and also has a bit different styling than the footer we have here. Um, for that, we'll just do pretty much the same as we did with the header. Uh, get into our omelet. Oh, no, my node modules are open here. Let me close that. Into our omelet. Uh, get us our, uh, the path and the files for our footer from components, theme, footer, footer JSX. Uh, copy that. Um, inside of our theme folder in the customizations, we're going to create another folder called footer to replicate the path, paste the footer JSX in here, and again, uh, restart the process. This is, this is where it comes in handy when you have a, a decently fast machine, otherwise uh, when you're doing a lot of those customizations, it always might take a bit longer for that to reload, but usually not a lot. Footer still looks the same because we haven't actually applied any changes to our customization. Um, that what we'll do um, next. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to paste the mark up from here inside of there and then uh, just go through it and explain to you why we did what in there. So our footer here, by the way, is again uh, the normal uh, React functional component that you've uh, got used to doing Alox training. We'll just delete the whole markup of that and paste in the markup from the training. Um, you'll see um, a few uh, errors coming up now. That is because we do not have the logo component imported into. Uh, our application here. That's what I'll do now. We add uh, import statement for the logo component. Uh, import da, 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 da. logo from add. Come on. Come on. Typing is hard. From the clone package, every time you want to have any uh, component that is made available in the uh, original clone package in your node modules, you can just import it from add clone slash Volto. And usually, most of those components then will already register uh, in the components index of Volto. How those indexes work, um, that's something we'll get to later. There are also a few um, 
internationalization messages and other stuff um, related to internationalization defined. We don't really need that for now. We can keep it around, but I'll uh, just delete that stuff to keep the code a little bit cleaner here. Also, we don't need any selectors in here. With that done, we can check out the footer on our page. And that already looks somewhat like uh, the one on the page we're trying to replicate, but there's still a bit of CSS we need to add to uh, make that actually look like the one we want. We can also just get that from the training documentation. This will just, uh, yeah, fix a few heights, a few margins, create a flex box for the uh, text bits that are next to each other and so on. And after you've done that, the page should, uh, after reload, no. Mm -hmm. Something happened here that caused it causes it to not properly pick up the CSS. Okay. Okay. Oh well uh, it does actually. The CSS is picked up. It's only the background uh, color that's the wrong color here. Uh, we can uh, just fix that by grabbing us the footer and then set another background color to let's just use a dark gray. No, dark gray is not. Uh, let's just use the default dark gray that the browser has for now. Hmm. Or we just go black. I think that's the best fit. Come on. Let's check why it's not picked up. UI inverted vertical cut segment. Dot footer. Ah, I think the footer class is probably missing here. Let's Second, no, it's not it's that one. Well, to be honest, this does not really play a big role whether we get the correct color in here or not. And I don't really want to waste our precious training time with um, trying to debug some uh, CSS that's not picked up correctly. So we'll just leave it with that. Um, okay, so that we have this, the basic frame uh, in place. There's one thing that we need to take care of and that is that uh, on the uh, plone.com page, we actually do not have this breadcrumbs bar down here. Um, this is where usually the breadcrumbs to the subpages, the subpage where you're at, would show up. Um, we'll just go and uh, grab, grab some CSS code to hide those. Um, 
we'll just grab this, drop that into our main styling file, jump back here and you'll see breadcrumbs are gone as we want them. Okay. I think now that we're uh, done uh, with a the basic theming and uh, almost at the half time point of our uh, Walter training, it's a good time to again um, have a five minute pause, um, grab a drink or a snack or whatever else you might need. I think I'll see you to, uh, not tomorrow in five minutes. So uh, I'll continue at uh, half past five and hope to see you back. I'll be around um, if you have any questions for the or problems with the current progress of the training. Well, I'll use the break and try to figure out why my color change for the footer is not picked up. There we go. This made it way easier.
Uh, Jacob? Yes. One question. Uh, you're using VS Code, don't you? Yes, I am. Uh, when I paste, like for example, the header JSX file, I try to not copy the file, just uh, copy the, the text of the file and yes. paste it into a new file. It gets intended by one space and the, the JavaScript is broken by that. I never had that issue with VS Code before. Uh, have, have you encountered that? Not Anytime? really. I mean, the intimidation yeah. in JavaScript usually does not even play a role because we're uh, working with braces and brackets and not yeah. intimidation like in Python. So, yeah, I, I know that. Odd. Um, Funnily, the linters and, and such things tell me just like, ah, oh, bad intentations, which might be no problem at all, but it's a funny, funny behavior. Okay, but, but okay. the code still works. Or Actually, I, I didn't try to, to ah, run okay. it. As when a linter tells me it's broken, then I try to understand why it's broken before I restart the server. But okay, I can try that. Yeah. yeah, usually with it's your PS code, you can, really... can also just go and try to, to get the linter fix it for you, right? Just format the document. Yeah, that's, that's what I hoped for, but it didn't. <laughs> but mm. okay, um, just, then, just there random might be a, Then there might be some, some wrongly set up uh, linting rules somewhere yeah. in your system, I'm not sure, or in your VS code. All right, I think we're good to go um, with the second half of the training. That's well be actually getting into the nitty gritty of uh, the blocks in Volto. Um, I'll close those files for now. Just get done with those. And we'll uh, check out blocks. Um, Usually, normal clone content types that come with a normal clone distribution don't support the rendering of those blocks. Um, you need a specific um, behavior enabled on your content type. So, for example, uh, if I go here and uh, log in as admin, 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 and add a new event content type, you'll see I end up in a normal edit form, which makes sense for the event content type, um, but I can't use the blocks as I would be able to do here on the front page. This is because the uh, blocks behavior per default is only uh, enabled on the document content type. Um, if we want to create a new content type, we also need to add that behavior in there. Um, to be able to enable that manually, um, you can pull up your uh, classic clone backend, go in there, go to site setup, Um, get to the dexterity content types control panel and for example in my case it was the event if I want to enable the blocks behavior in there um, I can just go to the behaviors and enable that save our new configuration when we now yes uh, jacob there is yes. one question by yes. michael like i noticed editing custom but over i need to be restart client to take effect sometimes it happens that your css does not apply to, uh, directly to the volto sometimes hot module replacement fails that's why we have you have this problem otherwise it will be like 
normal like sometimes it does not take effect otherwise it will be like yeah taking... usually you should not need to uh, restart it but there are some cases i can't really nail nail that down when that happens um but when you notice that your css from the custom overrides is not applied at all and that's not a problem with the potentially uh wrongly set selector or syntax error or something then uh, restarting the development process might always help so after i've now enabled the blocks behavior for all uh, i think it was event content type and we add a new event content type from the auto front end you'll see we have the um, settings for the event content type here on the right as we know it but also the blocks editor on the left side. Um, next thing we'll do is I think this, I think the most exciting part of this is to actually write our own block. Um, from our specification screenshot, we see that here on the top there is this um, slider thingy on top of the page and to reproduce that we want to uh, create a block that we can put on top of our page and have this uh, slider there um, for that we'll be going into our code editor again and are now entering the components folder inside of our project that should be uh, empty except for one index.js file. Um, and there we can uh, are no longer strictly bound to replicating paths from Volto, but just can set up our very own folder structure. So um, for my blocks, I'll just create a um, blocks folder in here. And then um, in there, create a new folder um, called main slider for our main slider, in which we'll drop all the files that we need to actually create that slider. Um, when we take a look at our uh, Volto page, we notice that some blocks look quite different from when we are in the editing view for uh, admins and editors, then when we are in the uh, normal view for visitors of your site. Um, for example, here, the image block that I added, that's just, I didn't add an image there. And because of that, in the normal view, it's just gone. And also here on the right, when I click on the um, image block, I have this um, sidebar open, which is um, not available uh, in the normal view. And for that, because of that, um, each block, in its core consists of two files one is for the markup that the user will see um, on the normal page um, we call that view.jsx usually and the other one respective with a markup that the user will see in the edit part um, of the block. Um, when we are uh, writing the markup for the block, we can just use the normal React code. So we'll import, uh, always import React from React first. Um, you noticed yesterday in Alok's training that um, in his application, that was not, not necessary to import React in every file, but because we're in Volto, we are using a slightly older version 
of React where this is not yet possible, we still need to do this here. Um, import React from React, and then we can just uh, define a new function. Um, we'll call this main slider block view. We'll pass it some props and define the markup for the component. For that, uh, for testing, we'll just create a div with some text in it. I am the slider uh, view component. Um, and at the end of the file, uh, we'll export it as a default from that file because we don't want to export anything else from here. Uh, was the other way around, right? Main slider block view. And now we can grab this markup and put it into the um, edit component of the block and rename, rename it accordingly and split up the markup. Bang, save it. And you should not uh, have the need to restart your development process now, um, but do a few other things. Um, next thing we'll do is um, go into the index.js file inside of the uh, components folder. We have a bunch of index.js files all over our projects. Also, um, there should be one in the actions file. And inside of Volto, there are also a bunch of index files. And they um, serve as kind of shortcuts for uh, importing components in other places. Um, this works in the way that we here import our uh, components from the blocks file from uh, dot slash blocks slash main slider slash view and then do the same with the edit thing. And then in the same file, export those again, but uh, this time not as a default export, uh, but just as a, a big, chunk of um, components that we're exporting, which we then in turn can import from um, slash package slash uh, components everywhere in our application. So we, in any file of our application, we can now go uh, import thing from command, uh, not command, hmm. add package slash components. Important. Uh, usually we would do that at the top and um, this spares us the work for a lot of imports that, that we'll need to run the project to always type out the complete path to slash blocks, slash main slider, slash edit. We can just say import the main slider block edit from this place, from this index file. Add package in this context um, refers to the root of our source folder and our project. 
Okay, so when we're done with that, we should be good to go to actually registering our block to Volto that so that it's ready to use. Um, all the blocks that are used in Volto are located um, inside the omelet, inside of um, the config file, and inside there we have a blocks file with all of our blocks defined here inside of the blocks config object. Let's see the title block, the description block, the text block, the image block, and so on and so on and so on. Um, as we cannot just go and edit this and also don't want to go and just uh, blatantly override it, we have uh, other solution for that. And that is the um, config JS file in the root of our project, or not in the root, but in the source file of our project. And in that, this, we'll find um, the apply config function already set up. In that, we can add anything that we want to add to the add or modify in the original configuration object of Volto. For our case, we want to add new stuff to the uh, blocks config object in Volto. Um, for that, we do have the code in here. First thing we need to do is import our uh, blocks inside of our, our config file, the view and the edit part of the block. We will need both of them here. And it is very important to import those before the final import uh, at clone Volto config statement. Otherwise, stuff will fail in there. And then we can go and um, add a new configuration option for the main slider block in here. Um, this seems to be some syntax error. Ah, yeah, the comma at the end is problematic and uh, we need to add a semicolon back here. And also uh, the naming from the stuff I've copied over here and um, the files with uh, components we reference here in the uh, options don't really correspond. Let me check if they actually correspond with those here. No, so we need to go here and uh, get the import names correctly here and also the reference to them at the top, correct the spelling. Only thing that's now missing is uh, the icon for, for our block. For that, we'll use slider SVG. That is an SVG icon that is already available in the Volto core package. You can uh, have a look at those when you go into your omelet and check out the folder um, source slash icons. There are all icons that are already available um, in Volto. You can also drop your icons into your own icons folder in your project if necessary. But for our use case, we're pretty good with the icons that Volto already offers to us. Um, and with that done, we should be able to add our very first own block to our project. So. Um, we go into the pro uh, into our browser at localhost 3000 and log in as admin. The default credentials. Oh, there's there is stuff wrong. 
Oh yeah, there is this part is wrong. I think I made a bit of a typo in our uh, in the documentation there. So we want to add this main slider thing into the config and inside of the config to uh, the blocks object inside of the blocks object to the blocks config object. We can also use the same logic to uh, override blocks. For example, we could also say that, that uh, our title block in this place should now be represented by the components we have from our uh, main slider. But that's not what we, that's not what we want at the moment. We'll just add it as a new block reload the page that's what you need to do every time you run into those errors just reload the page one time and um, after you fix the error uh, in your code it also should be fixed there you log in get into the edit view of our page create a new line by pressing enter and you'll see in our most used section. And that is because in the configuration for our block, we have uh, most used set to true. Uh, we have the main slider. Let's quickly add that in. And you'll see the markup that we defined in the uh, edit part. I am the main slider com uh, edit component. And after we save that, we'll see the other markup. I am the main slider view component. When you're seeing that, uh, that means everything worked well and you've uh, you've successfully added your block here. Are there any questions so far or any problems you might need help with? Okay, I guess uh, someone got an error. Okay, can you paste it, Michael? Main slider block view, not main slider protect. Yeah, that looks like a typo. Do I have the typo or app or what? Or do you did you have the typo? No, at least there's no typo. Typo in here. Well, okay. I think we're good to go then. Regarding typos in uh, my documentation, please, of course, let me know. Okay, in the docs, yeah. I'll, I'll fix them after the training, so um, we don't waste our time with that right now. Um, also, um, will not go into this much deeper, but um, we'll define some messages for uh, internationalization uh, in our config file that we can later, when once more familiar with how the internationalization engine in Volta works, um, used to translate uh, your block title in this case to other languages. Those always consist of an ID and a default message as it's normal for most uh, internationalization oh, yeah. systems and software. Okay, so next thing 
would be um, taking a look at the actual markup of our slider. Um, first thing we need to do for that is um, get ourselves a new dependency or, or actually two dependencies. Those are React Slick and Slick Carousel. Those will help us with just rendering the um, slider markup and not having to care about um, implementing uh, slider transitions and that kind of stuff. So we uh, stop our development process and paste the um, install command, yarn add. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Ah, okay, again, error in the documentation. What we need to do is yarn add dash w. Um, because a Volta project has uh, already defined multiple yarn workspaces in it. And we want to add it to the root of that. Um, after we're done with that, um, we can start our process again and go back to our custom overrides and what we can do inside of uh, less files. Um, be aware that custom overrides is indeed a less file, although it says dot overrides and not dot less, but the dot overrides and dot uh, variable um, file endings are interpreted as less files. Um, and in those less files, we can actually import other uh, less or CSS files and use their um, styling information inside of our project. Okay, after we're done with that, we can get into actually into the markup of our actual slider. Um, for that, I'll copy over the markup from the training and then we'll take a look at it in detail. I'll paste everything in here. And um, I get one warning from our linter because we're uh, importing, trying to import the slider.png file, which is not present yet. That's something that we need to get from our training resources. Uh, in our case, that would be the slider image. Um, download it. Um, to your machine and grab it. Grab it and then put it back. Ah, come on, this is horrible. One sec, I'll just. Uh, copy it and open up. open up my uh, finder in here. So components, blocks, main style, and drop that, come on, drop that in here. There it is. Perfect. I restart the development process. Reopen the Vue.jsx, and now my linter has also picked up the path. Um, what we're doing with our markup here is um, first thing is we we'll import the slider component from the React Slick library and are using 
this inside of our normal markup here. Then um, this component receives a bunch of props. Um, apart from others, there is the next arrow and previous arrow um, props where you should pass uh, an React component into them as uh, the markup for the left and right arrows, arrows of the slider. Those are defined up here as rather simple uh, buttons that use the left and right arrows, SVGs, um, as their icon. And then on click, um, do an action. Are we actually defining an on click handler for them somewhere? Uh, they get past an on click handler automatically from the slider when they are inserted in here. We go to our page. We see our slider looks a bit like this. So a little bit weird, but we'll tackle that with some additional markup we can get from our training. That's down here. We don't really bother in the training on what exactly this is because we're trying to learn Volto and not uh, details of CSS. So we'll just drop it in here and more or less forget about it. Uh, this seems not correct. This fixes it. What the fuck? Does that work? Yeah, well, it works. No, I idea where this text comes from. But as I said, we don't care about that for the moment. And with that, I think our slider already looks quite neat and does what it should do. Um, you'll see in the view we've uh, defined a bunch of slides inside of the slider and we can just switch through them. Yeah. Um, now, when we want to recreate um, the original volto.com page, we need to get rid of a bunch of uh, other blocks. For example, the description up here and all of the text that has been created as example content. You can go through here and just click on each, click on the trash can. Bam, bam. Um, um, as we are not really doing anything editing wise with the slider, we can for now keep it um, this way. What we could also do is go into our edit JSX of the slider, import uh, slider view from dot slash view and just display the same thing as in the view in the um, as in the view part of the component. Come on. We'll pass it the same props as the edit component already got. So oops. 
Right, a few correct markup here. And we have a data as only Frank. Has any data here? Malok, do you have an idea? There we go. Just destructuring our props. Very well. For the time being, we then just leave it that way. It was a nice try to make that look a little bit better than um, it is in the training. And also, now that I did that, I forgot to save and everything here is back. This, 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 delete the description. What we are actually, what I was actually trying to show to you is that we now run into the problem that we can just not delete the um, title block in here. Um, and that is because uh, inside of the uh, blocks configuration in Volto, um, which uh, lives here, there is an array called we wired blocks and that has um, the title block in it to uh, make that required and undeletable on a page. We want to override that. So for that, we again go into uh, the config layers of our file and we then can go config.blocks um, let me check whether in the blocks file, yeah, that's directly uh, inside the blocks configuration object. You know, config of blocks that required blocks equals um, empty array, and we should oh, come on. I forgot to save again. What's going on? No, there was some weird bug with the markup. We are now able to just hit delete on the title. And as you can see, now we have a perfectly empty page except for our slider in here with no title block at the top annoying us. All right. Next thing is um, the base of clone, as you might know, are content types. And um, what we are now going to learn is how to create a custom view for our content type. So um, different content types can have different ways um, to display them and we're going to go create a new content type that is called success story um, from our reference here uh, uh, uh. the su success stories are the pages that uh, are hidden behind those links in here the yesterday bar QA for wave, social internet for two, and so on and so on. Those are all success story pages. And we want to have that content type with a custom view. To do that, we'll create a new um, content type from the dexterity con uh, control panel and uh, in our local host 8080, of course. So we're back to the um, classic clone interface. And we're gonna go add a new content type that is then called success 
story, um, short name, success story, description is not necessary for our use case, we'll add it. Um, grab it here and enable the blocks behavior. Um, so, ah, yeah, actually, one thing I missed is that we also want to have the um, lead in it behavior because our success stories are supposed to have a lead in it. They are done. All right. When we go back into uh, our Walter application and reload one time, You'll see we'll, we are now able to add the success story content type to our page. Click on it and you get right back into the uh, editing view of the content type. Um, okay. so some uh, stuff in there. I am a success story, save it. And it'll just behave like a document because we didn't, except for the lead image, we didn't add any behaviors. What we want to do now is to get the lead image to actually work. And for that, we need to need to write custom markup for the success story view component. We are gonna go and create a new file for that. So inside of our components, we have a blocks folder. And as we are now not creating a block, but actually a view for a content type, we're gonna create a views folder. Makes sense, I guess. And inside that, we only need one file because the edit part of a view is in Volto is always auto-generated. You cannot um easy at least not easily there are ways around this but um not easily interfere how the um editing view of a content type is displayed it's usually just the um blocks editor if the blocks behavior is enabled and additionally inside of this right sidebar you can also uh, make that big with this arrow up here um you have the metadata of the block. What we are going to do is modify the way it looks in the for the user, not for an editor. So inside of here, we create a new file, and that's called success story view JSX. Hit enter. And we're gonna uh, grab the markup from the training again. And after that, there's one thing. We need to go back to our config again because Volto needs to know that this view that we created here is again, uh, mapped to a real content type and also um, as i've already showed you it makes sense to import and export that in our index file so we, before we go to the config we'll, we'll import it shortly that uh, success story view um, dot slash views slash Success story view. Export it again. Go to the config. We need to import it, obviously. So import from uh, that. Package slash 
Actually, now that we are on it, we can now go and make this uh, way easier because we are exporting all of those files from our index file in the components folder. We can go and just get those also from there. Should have done that way earlier. But um, this way, we don't need to iterate all the paths that we have here, but we can just get all the components we need from this central component directory. And we need to add another configuration option. In our case, we're modifying the views configuration, um, which has this path from the markup here. We'll just put in uh, config config of use as contents as a success story equals our success story view. Save that. Something here in the training markup again went a bit wrong. And my content type was actually called success story underscore, I think. Finally, no reload. On a success story. Uh, it's not getting picked up. Let me quickly check what's the what the um, internal name of that view is. Types response. Success underscore star. Ah, okay. Our case. Yeah, we, here we go. You'll see uh, I am the success story view component. Um, it has got picked up correctly. Um, here we have this mark up here. Uh, uh, is more or less bullshit. What we need to use is this here. So what we want to do is we want to display the normal default view in there, but we also want to um, get an image for the lead image up in there. So what we do first is grab ourselves um, the markup from here and replace this. And um, here we are replace, uh, importing the default view that is the uh, Volto component that renders all the blocks and so on. Drops that, drop that inside of our success story save that so then we should be back to uh, the normal view but we also want to have the image on top so um we're gonna go and um wrap this whole thing into um brackets or braces those things and then wrap this with what is called a React fragment. A React fragment is um, necessary because you cannot render two DOM elements in the JSX. Like here we want next to the default view. They're directly next to each other uh, directly in the return of the component. Everything needs to be wrapped in uh, some DOM element and we could use a diff here but 
an archive, we can also just use a fragment that in the return in our browser will just not be rendered, but it's necessary to make this year work prog programmatically. Um, we'll give our uh, image the class name for a CSS reference. And then we have two other things, the alt tag and the source field for our image. And those are filled from the content that is added um, to the view by uh, the editor. Um, content in this case can be replaced with uh, props.content because um, it comes from the props. Another way to do this would be to, uh, to define it in before that props equals content uh, const in before, uh, not pro, uh, content, uh, content the other way around, of course, content equals the props. This way, um, the props keyword will be immediately available down here and will be filled automatically by the content uh, object inside of the props. We could also go and get data and some other properties that are in the props in here, but we only need the content down here. So we'll go with this way for now. There are a few ways how uh, we can use our props inside of a component. You've now seen a bunch of them. So you can just go props like, and um, you can just go props like an edit. You can um, inside the function definition already define what you want uh, to get as props inside of an object, or you can do it like this. There's no um, wrong or right here, it depends on what the use case is and what your personal preference here is. Um, only problem that's left now is that uh, the flatten to app URL function is not defined. Um, that is because we uh, need to import that from Volto. Flatten to app URL is a function that um, gets the uh, gets in any kind of URL from an internal context of the page past and then transforms that to a URL that is usable um, inside of the app to reference the content. Um, we'll import that here from Walter clone helpers. And with that out of the way, we should be able to go ahead, reload our page, and we get an error. That is because we don't actually have an image added um, because we didn't upload one in the edit view. Um, to avoid this image, we can uh, use conditional rendering in here, which means we only want to uh, render this image thing if, suppose, let's suppose content.image actually has content. So we say content.image and end, but this is basically um, shortcut for uh, if conditional under the condition that content.image exists, render this part, otherwise don't do nothing. If we reload now, we don't get the error anymore, but we can go into our success story and are actually able to uh, add an image here. From our training resources, we can uh, grab ourselves the success story lead image, PNG, download that, save it, and just use drag and drop, drop it in there, save it, and we should be able to see it now. Let me debug this real quick.
Ah, okay. It is already there. Just took a while to load. And it is massive. So obviously we need a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit, bit more CSS to get that to a more reasonable size. We should have a bit of CSS in here. Indeed we have. We'll drop it into the overrides file. When we check back, this looks way more reasonable than what we what we had before. Okay, are we all on the same page, at least those who are coding along with me? Or are there any questions that popped up? And also to those who are not coding along and just watching anything you didn't quite understand why I did something or why I did not do something, please let me know. Well, I guess I'll interpret silence to uh, everything's fine and you are all good. So uh, let's carry on. It's only, yeah, almost half an hour left, but we also only have uh, two chapters left, which means I think we're quite good in time. Um, Next thing we want to do is create a highlights block. Um, with the highlights, I is I think um, that is again the part where we uh, refer get the references to our uh, success stories. So we're gonna get gonna go ahead and create a new block. So inside of our blocks folder, I'm gonna create a new uh, another new folder for a new block and call that highlight. Enter. And as we've um, already learned for uh, the markup of a block, we need the view part and the, and the edit part. View and in the same place, edit that JSX. Um, for that, we just gonna go ahead, grab ourselves the markup from the training to spare some time, not typing all that uh, HTML out. Uh, ah, no, that's the that's the wrong we want to put that in the view part of our component um we are again missing two images so um, i will go ahead and download them from our resources so here Into Let's get a, a finder up here to make the dragon uh, drag and drop a little bit easier. To our downloads. Oh, they're already there. Not quite. Why didn't that work? Ah, okay, they're coming as a zip file. You know, I don't want to unzip that stuff now. Come on, stop it. Cancel. Uh, let's download them individually. Download. And download. There we go. 
copy them, go into uh, the respective folder. Drop them in here. A uh, quickly reopen the editor so the linter picks them up. And if we go back to our front page and uh, add a new block, which is the, uh, yeah, obviously. Um, you might have noticed what I missed. Um, that is that we need to register the block, obviously, as we did with this one. We need a new configuration entry for the uh, highlights block. So we're going to go ahead and just copy this configuration entry from the first one for uh, sake of simplicity and just um, go ahead and replace the keywords we need to get the exports and imports right again so uh, let's get over here copy those imports and just go um my lines block view and highlights block edit and get those from highlights of course and then make them available in the export save it get back to the config where we need the imports so we need highlight slider block edit and highlight slider block view. Those are gonna get used in the uh, configuration for the highlights block view. Uh, but you can see here, and this way we now should be able to uh, add our second new block we reload the page we go to the edit version of it and we'll see it's still called main slider because i haven't replaced the text here And there we go. We have the highlights block with a huge error because uh, we haven't defined any markup in the edit uh, file for the highlights block. So what we're going to do to just uh, prevent that error from happening, we'll go ahead and take the markup for the view part of the block and dump that also into the edit um switch it up but this is called edit and we are also exporting edit down here and when we now go ahead and edit there we go we have the rough outline of um this whole part of the page down here. So we'll go ahead and save. Something's quite buggy right now. Save. Save it. There we go.
in the center column of our block here, we have the recent launches. And that's where we want to query all the success stories that we had. Um, to do that, we're going to go ahead and use the search endpoint that uh, Plone REST API provides. And we create a new component inside uh, of the highlights block that we are going to reuse, well, which is called, um, and not, not a whole folder, new file, which is called uh, so, uh, recent success stories. drop in some markup here. And in here, um, we're gonna go back to our highlights view and uh, import the component we just created. So import success store. Recent from what slash recent success stories. Um, Let's quickly get this typo fix success story triple S. And we want to display those in here in our marker. So let's call the recent success stories component and don't give him any props because at the moment when you look at it, it just returns uh, an empty error, uh, just a diff without any co uh, content that is accessed from the props. And check our markup again. And here we'll see uh, the list of success stories. Let's continue to get those success stories. So inside, uh, of our um, view component here, we do want to um, pass the ID of the component, which is the path basically of it, down to, um, to our success story. So we're gonna go ahead and say ID is, props dot id um, as i've already told you there are uh, different ways how you can rename or, uh, the props you're using you can go props dot id down here or you can define it up here i'm differing from the training now i'm using the props way of doing it um, like this and when we now go into our recent success success story and do a console.log props.id, we should be getting the ID that the block, the parent block got passed through. There we go. With this, this one. inside of the uh, recent su successory component. We gonna get, again, a bunch of new JSX, uh, which I'll now explain to you. Um, as you've learned uh, from Alloc's training, we have the use effect hook in place here. Um, we are not importing it directly, but we're using the reference notation from React, but we could also go ahead and import it from here um, and then leave out 
this bit uh, also depends on personal preference, how one wants to know, uh, note that kind of stuff down. Inside of the use effect, which is called every time the component mounts, we are gonna dispatch an action. And the action in this context is search content. And this is a uh, action defined in Volto that then in turn triggers the call onto the Volto REST API because as we are, have learned with Alloc, we can use the Redux engine to have a middleware that when um, actions are dispatched, also dispatch um, API calls to REST API and for pretty much all um, normal clone API endpoints, there are already actions available in Volto. So we pass this um, search content function, the following um, parameters, it shall search on the uh, root path, it shall uh, sort the results by its their creation date and return all metadata fields. And the most important thing is the query parameter is portal type. So we only want to search for everything that has the portal type success story. After that's done, um, we are gonna get the results uh, in here. Um, they for that we use the use selector hook, which is, um, as we saw in Alloc's training, a hook to connect to the actual Redux state and get uh, the search results. And the reason why ne we needed the ID in here is that um, inside of the um, search dot search sub request reducer there will, might be um, potentially data from multiple search requests, from multiple requests that went to that endpoint and to get the correct request um, for our block, um, we identify it by this UID that I uh, showed in the console uh, a minute ago. Let's get that back again, dot log ID. And hey, here you can see this is the UID of the block we are using. And I have also installed the development tools from Redux where you can see all the actions and reducers that are used and actually can inspect the whole store in here with a lot of data that's just internally for use of Volto, but also we should have the uh, search entry in here and in there in the sub requests is the request for our block 979 df and so on and so on and that returns us with items one because we are only created one su success story so far um So we use uh, this line here, the results we get are actually um, the items that are in our particular sub request here, identified by the ID. We're using those qu uh, question marks because um, when mounting the component, um, search sub requests and especially the sub request will be initially undefined because this uh, request haven't, hasn't finished yet and that would run into an error. With uh, those uh, question marks, we can avoid these kinds of errors um, because JavaScript will then just say, uh, if this thing is not there, is undefined, I will not try to look for those uh, sub objects of that object and just return undefined instead of an error. Um, 
when we now take a look at our component here, we'll see that our success story that we have here is actually listed. If we want to test that further, we can uh, add another success story. Save it, jump back to our front page, and you'll see the second one also pops up down here. Um, okay. As we got that out of the way, um, what we could do now, let me check the clock, is uh, finish the bodies here, although this will be quite trivial because for the right side we'll just add an image from uh, our training resources and for the right side just add a bunch of text that is statically sitting there so i think um that is not that interesting for the training and i'll skip that um instead of doing that we'll go straight to the last chapter and um and in this we'll see how we can actually um, create the edit part of a block because currently all blocks we've so far added are just static and you can't really do anything with them when you're here in the in the edit view they are quite useless in that way um, and we're gonna have a look how to make a block that is actually uh, editable for an editor. For that, again, we're going to create a new block. Um, in our case, it will be a teaser. So um, that is a block that is not actually necessary for um, recreating this front page here, but um, can come in handy in a lot of cases where you just want to have a blog that teases some other content, so a link to, to other content with potentially a preview image. For that, we're going to go ahead and uh, go again into our blocks directory here, create a new blog called um, teaser, uh, create the mandatory edit and view files, Um, add some markup in there, uh, which we'll take a look at later. And do the mandatory imports. Yeah. Const. Uh, this is the teaser block view dot uh get some props in here and let it return and inside of that again welcome I am a teaser block. Put the same thing in here. Um, replace the edit keyword and export it in both files. Edit. And go ahead. The view. Um, then the tedious work of 
I'm getting the imports in here. So these are these export them. Again, get to the config. Copy a config entry again for block. Teaser. Important for those config entries, by the way, is that the ID and the name of the JavaScript object here must match. So I can't go here and capitalize it. Those must match. We're again going to just use the same SVG uh, to spare us the time to look for fitting SVG. And then we uh, need to get teaser block view and teaser block edit in there. So Volto knows what React components actually should be used there. And I think in theory, we should be able to add that. It, I have a teaser block, perfect. Um, but now where it gets interesting is when we get to uh, the edit part of the teaser. Um, as you might have noticed, uh, when using blocks, especially blocks that you can configure um, in some way, we have this sidebar on the right. And um, how we configure that is the um, thing I, I'm gonna show you next. We, for this, uh, for that, use the sidebar portal provided by Volto inside the edit part of our component. So not in the view, only in the edit. Um, which means in the JSX, we go ahead and uh, wrap this again with the uh, uh, React fragments so we can put in the sidebar portal uh, directly in here. Select it in this case. Depends on whether the block is selected or not. That comes from the plot props and uh, in turn gets passed to the block edit component by the blocks rendering engine of Volto. Um, so the sidebar portal knows whether it's selected or not um, via the prop selected. And close that tag again. And inside of that sidebar portal, we can now put uh, stuff that should be rendered in the sidebar. Um, usually to make the code a little bit more uh, better to, re to read and uh, split up into logical pieces, we then create a teaser data.jsx component in which we define um, what should be shown inside of the sidebar. Um, I have put some markup for that in side of the training, I think, in here. 
we grab that and put that in here. Uh, there's still um, an error in there. This should be schema teaser and not listing because that code was originally copied from the listing block. Now we're going to go with schema teaser. And um, as we might expect, we want to have um, the, this schema that we import from here does not exist yet. So we need to create another file called schema.js. I'm using the JS and not JSX keyword here because this is a, a JavaScript file which actually does not render any uh, React JSX stuff, but is pure JavaScript with um, no uh, HTML that it returns and inside of there we drop um, the schema for this this is basically uh, just a big javascript object in which um, different uh, kinds of fields can be defined and of case uh, we are defining one field set um, with the title, uh, title default that at the moment only have one field and that is the teaser fields and those fields in turn um, are defined down there um, clone users uh, might already be quite um, uh, familiar with this kind of notation because it's this is a bit similar to how you would define an interface. Uh, and and uh, just one no. thing, yes. uh, Jacob, we only yes. have I think five or eight minutes, something like that. I think yeah, we, we are good with five to ten minutes. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, we can uh. We need to, uh, in our edit part of the component, import the, uh, what was it, the teaser data. The data from at, and not from the same location, so from the teaser data file, and then render it. Um, like uh, where's my edit part like this so we need a bunch of props for the teaser data to work um those are all undefined i'm gonna go ahead and use the this notation the object notation to constant we need block we need data and we need on change block in here. Those are all given to us by the props from the uh, blocks rendering engine. And when we now go into our Volto and reload, Attempted import a schema does not contain a default. Um, one sec. Oh, yeah. In here, the export is missing. Export default. Uh, schema teaser. Now the import should work. Exactly. And when we go to the edit view and click on the teaser block, um, schema.required is undefined. We need to let me check. So, Okay. 
Bash with the weak. Okay, we just need to add an empty required array down here. Click on the block. We see inside of our sidebar that we now have uh, actually a teaser field in here from which we can call an object browser with which you can browse to the side and select uh, any content you want that should be shown in this teaser. Um, we don't, do not have the markup yet to actually show the teaser. That's the last thing we need to add. Um, as we're running a bit out of time, I'm going to just copy that over. We've just created one new component for that that will be called teaser body, which then in turn contains the actual uh, markup for the teaser itself. And then we can go. Um, import that also in here import teaser body from slash body and instead of this stuff we render the teaser body um let me quickly check what props we need data. I don't know. Data ID. Equals data data ID works think uh, well, let's get the ID to is edit mode it's just always true because we are in the edit code and INTL we're also going to get from here. And we take this and put the same thing in the view part of the component without the uh, sidebar. Da, da, da. Get the import line. Um, and then yeah, yeah, just uh, we are not in edit mode, and here it's faster to just say props always. Um, yeah. And now we should actually be able to select content. Yep. Kind of. Did I miss anything? I think I missed something. We go into the edit here of the teaser body um, let me check i think one of the field names might actually be wrong that was a lock Data. Dot href. Ah, 
Let's get the whole data object instead. Console is not a function. Also console.log, of course. Have the console. Click it. Ah, okay. Thing is, uh, we need to access not data.href, we need to access data.teaser. And in our case, teaser is an array of multiple potential teasers that we add, but we only want to have one. So we always want to add access uh, data.teasers um, at the first place in the array. Let's check if that's correct. Yes. Then do a search and replace after data href with this and then add back our block teaser. Uh. Something went horribly wrong here. Create drag and drop. Are we using create drag and drop somewhere? Is that funny? Yeah. Uh, ah, damn. Tuple, obviously. It's plural. Teasers. Let's use conditional queuing to um, Here we go, block on the successor, save it. Results, uh, uh, so what is result? Results is not yeah, I want to get at least this working before we wrap it up. So you can watch me debugging a bit. Uh, undefined. Let's check what requests we are firing. Capillaries, we're not dispatching. Yeah, 
the problem is that with the code I have here, I'm getting the ID from, from the teaser that I've selected in here. And then I'm dispatching a get content request, which is basically if a request onto that um, specific uh, object that is selected as a teaser in here. But for some reason, that request does not get dispatched, and I haven't seen that before. Alok, do you have any ideas why this is happening? Uh, I think that you are not getting the data. And that's why think... you have star.tjas.0 and you are only able to show the image below. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. This is always undefined. So we are only ever showing the fallback. But um, why is this is the get content request not dispatched? When we check here, it's just not getting sent. If it just just remove the dispatch data and the ID, like just an empty this. dependency yeah. array might work. Yeah. No, 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 no. Also, this uh, empty array. Okay, without any dependency array. Yeah. Let's reload. It's not getting dispatched. If you, you have this if condition, remove this if the condition. Mm, that could be the case, yeah. Mm, okay, we need to get the dependency array back. Stop, stop, stop. We're flooding our service with server with bullshit requests. Okay, so just put the empty array. Just put the empty array. No, then it will not work. No, 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 no. You are doing something wrong. That contains. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. I think that you do not have to do the dispatch because when you select the content, the content is already in the data yeah i guess so then let's get rid of this whole thing and um just uh go for this and uh, just go data.teasers zero here instead of results um, I think that way it should probably work. No. Data, not data.teasers. Then we get this. Let's check what data.teasers is. But uh, if I don't get that fixed now, I guess we're gonna have to call a bit of an unsatisfying end to our training here. Uh, I have to again, get this. Just put the console of data dot teasers and remove all the things. Data dot teasers zero is undefined. Data dot teasers that way is also undefined. What is it then? Data tease. Oh, it's it's singular. Naming man. Results is undefined, I know. Results, where are we using that? We want to use. Uh, 
from civil Here we go. Finally, so we are accessing the reference we've set here uh, with data dot teaser and not doing the uh, extra request. And we got it here and now can see this here, finally. So uh, it's getting gone quite late. I say uh, we wrap it up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're done. Um, and uh, I wish you a nice evening and happy hacking on clone. And I hope, although, uh, this was a bit bumpy today with my training. Um, I hope you learned a lot or at least um, as much as you expected and are eager to jump onto Volto and uh, creating your own pages with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm going to stop sharing and have a nice evening. Alok, can you stop the meeting? Yes, I can. So, okay, okay, then see you. Bye.